All right, well, we are in Mark chapter 9, finishing up Mark chapter 9 this morning. And if we were to look back at where we've been in Mark and kind of think through Mark's world, we were talking about this this morning, uh, the world that Mark presents to us is a chaotic world in his gospel, right? We see Jesus moving from one place to another. We see demonic oppression. We see brokenness. We see disease. We see people who are in need of rescuing, in bondage to spiritual powers, in bondage to sin and death. We see Jesus coming into chaos and bringing with him peace. Right? He, he walks on the waters as the disciples were unable to get across uh, the, the sea because of the wind, and he guides them across. We see Jesus on the boat with a great storm that is causing chaos and panic for the disciples, and Jesus is asleep, right, being the perfect picture of peace. And he stands up and he rebukes the wind and the waves, and they bow down before him. We see Jesus uh, leading thousands of people, and they're hungry, and they begin to grumble, wondering where their next meal will come. And Jesus provides them uh, thousands of men, women, and children with bread and fish to eat. He sits them down on green pastures. We see uh, Herod and John the Baptist and John's beheading in a gruesome detail. We see uh, this little boy uh, a couple weeks ago who is struggling, being possessed, and he is having seizures and he's grinding his teeth. This is the world that Mark has presented to us, right? Unlike Matthew, where if you were to look at Matthew or even Luke, we see a world of religious systems that Jesus is engaging and pressing back against. But in Mark's world, it is very chaotic. And Jesus comes as king to rule and bring peace to this chaotic world. And throughout the gospel of Mark, there has been Jesus' sidekicks, right? The disciples, And the disciples begin by being excited that they are following this king, this this Jesus who has the wit to argue with the Pharisees and the scribes, to to outduel them in a debate, and they love that. Uh, They love that they're following this Jesus that is able to make the lame man walk. And he's provocative, and he's providing food for people. And the disciples all along have been following this Jesus uh, because... He's worthy of following. And it hasn't been until the last couple chapters, about halfway through Mark, where he starts to really focus in on these disciples. And what we see is Mark, in his world, creating uh, chaos, if you would, with, with blind people. He, he contrasts Jesus' healing of the blind with the blindness of the disciples, Right? He contrasts the, the hard-heartedness of the sinners with the hard-heartedness of the disciples. And the disciples are used for us, as we look through it, almost like a lesson of what not to be as followers of Jesus. Whereas these people who were once possessed by a, a, a demon is willing to follow Jesus wherever he goes, yet the disciples are willing to follow as long as it's good for them. Right? They begin to argue who's the greatest. They begin to think... Later on, we'll look at this, how, uh, which one will get to sit at Jesus' right hand when he takes his throne. The disciples have been this bland witness, if you would. And Jesus has a problem with that. In fact, Jesus begins to really focus in on the disciples' blandness, if you would, in our passage this morning, where he does not want bland disciples, not bringing any flavor, not bringing any potency uh, to the world. He wants salty disciples. Right? He wants disciples that are salty, disciples that take their walk with God seriously. So this morning, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 9, and the, the, the topic in, in the study is going to be, how do we be salty disciples? What does it look like to be a salty disciple? So if you would, look with me at Mark chapter 9. We're going to be in verse 38 through 50. So we're going to finish up Mark chapter 9 this morning. So I'll go ahead and read it. It says, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be, soon, will be able uh, soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one 
who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? And then Jesus says, have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So here we see Jesus speaking to the disciples' concerns. Concerns that there's this other guy out there casting out demons. So Jesus speaks to this, and not only does he speak to this situation, but he speaks to the disciples' hearts and their care for one another. And he speaks not only to their hearts and their care for one another, but he speaks to them in their own lives, saying, listen, you need to be active disciples in mortifying sin, in cutting sin out of your life. So this is what it looks like to be a salty disciple, and this is what we're going to explore this morning. So when we think about salt in our world today, there's really three Purposes. There's one main purpose for us today, which most of us experience, which is flavor, right? Salt is good to put on food. It adds flavor. It enhances food. Salt also preserves. This was a big thing for uh, the people in Jesus' day. Without modern refrigeration, they would pack their food in salt, and it would preserve the food for a longer period of time. We also see that salt has medicinal purpose. It purifies right? Saline water, saline solution, or if you get an IV, they're pumping your body full of fluid, which includes salt. It purifies. And in the Bible, we see each of these meanings represented as well, right? We see salt used for flavor. We see salt used to preserve, and we see salt used to purify. Yeah, we also see salt used as a metaphor for our lives and our relationship with God. And here in our passage this morning, we see Jesus telling his disciples that they are to be salty. And we'll explore what this means. Look with me at verse 50, Mark 9, 50. Jesus says, salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So salt is good, Jesus says, as long as it maintains its saltiness. It is the distinctive saltiness of salt that makes salt worth its salt, right? Let's see how many times we can say salt this morning before it starts sounding kind of funny, which it already does to me. So it's good for flavor, but if it loses its saltiness, you won't put it on food, right? It's pointless. There's no reason to have salt if it loses its saltiness. And we know... uh, by our palate, if food needs more salt, we're used to this, right? If you go to uh, Wendy's or McDonald's or Burger King and you get French fries, you are expecting to get a lot of salt. And there's those times where you reach in and you pull out a French fry and you eat it. It's like, man, there's no salt on this thing. Or there are times where you reach in and you take it. It's like, whoa, there's way too much salt on this, right? We are very much used to salt, and it is to enhance flavor. And we see this in the sacrificial system in Leviticus as well. You see, salt was used in sacrifices for the Jewish people in the Old Testament. Oftentimes, we think about sacrifices as kind of this doom and gloom ritual that took place for the people of God in the Old Testament, full of blood, full of guilt, full of shame, uh, as if every sacrifice was an atonement of guilt or shame. And that was part of the sacrificial system. Yet, the sacrifices were a centerpiece 
for the ecosystem of the people of God, right? Their whole lives surrounded and came into context around the sacrificial system, and there were dozens of different types of sacrifice. So yes, you had guilt and shame sacrifices where blood needed to be atoned so that you could uh, have, have your sins covered before a holy God, but there were also sacrifices that took place daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, on special occasion, and many of these sacrifices were sacrifices of worship. This is a sacrifice that the family would come together. Uh, in Leviticus 3, we see the grain offering, and the family would come together, and they would bring to the temple grain and oil and herbs, and they would mix it up in this griddle, and they would bring it to the priest, and the priest would put it on the fire, and then they would put salt on it. And then what would happen is that they would cook it, and the idea of salt was to flavor, to bring pleasure, not only for the priest who got to eat some of it, not only for the family who got to eat some of it, but for God as well. Because the idea of this sacrifice was coming and feasting with Yahweh. And we want to bring our best. So the, uh, Moses was told by God and told the Jewish people to put salt on these sacrifices as a pleasing and flavorable sacrifice to God. It was an exciting time. In fact, every single time salt is used in the sacrificial system was for a sacrifice of worship. One of them was daily, and then there was another sacrifice of worship, which was used as like an ordination when a priest would come in and be ordained to be a priest. They would do another sacrifice, and it was a sacrifice of worship, and they would put salt on the, on the sacrifice. And throughout we see uh, this phrase, a salt of the covenant, right? This is another way in which uh, the, the salt of the covenant was used in the sacrifices, and this term means this is an everlasting covenant of worship, right? This symbolizes so much more than making this little griddle with, with herbs and flour and grain and salt and oil, but this is an everlasting covenant, an everlasting feasting with God, the salt of the covenant. We also see that salt was used for preservation. In fact, in the, Jew, uh, in the Jewish world, uh, there was a, a phrase that, that would say, the world cannot survive without salt. For them, this was a very real thing. The world would not survive without salt. We need salt in order to preserve our food, in order to preserve the things that we need to continue living without everything becoming decayed and rotting. We also see salt used for purification. In Ezekiel, he talks about the people of God are like a baby who, have, who has not yet been cleansed, who have not been purified, been washed with salt water, right? So it, it's used as this image of purification as well. So when Jesus tells his disciples to have salt in yourselves, to be salty, don't lose your saltiness, this is what he's referring to. We, as followers of Christ, we ought to have a saltiness that brings flavor to the world, that preserves and that purifies. So this is what we're going to look at this morning. First, salty disciples flavor the world. Salty disciples flavor the world. One of the most effective ways Christians can flavor the world for Christ is by living at peace with one another. We see this again in verse 50. Salt is good, Jesus says, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Be at peace with one another. Christian unity is of utmost importance in Jesus' mind. It's of utmost importance in the entire Bible, but particularly in Jesus' ministry to the church as he speaks to the church, not only in the Gospels, but in Revelation, as he speaks to the church through the Apostle Paul, through the other apostles and the epistles that we see throughout the New Testament, Christian unity is one of the most important themes in all the New Testament. In fact, it is for this unity that Christ has come. He has come to break down those dividing walls of hostility. This is what the gospel is about, bringing the people of God together. But the disciples had a problem in our passage this morning. We see this, that they are not so much interested in unity and peace because they see this other man casting out demons at the beginning of our passage, which is verse 38 through 41, and they have a problem with that. So let's look at this, uh, this passage, Mark 9, 38 through 41. John, one of the disciples, said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, 
And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. I think this, this passage is funny because there's this dark, almost sticky irony that comes up in this passage. Because you have the disciples coming to Jesus, upset because this man is casting out demons, right? Now, this is the same thing in Mark 6 that Jesus gave the disciples authority to do, right? To go out and cast out demons in his name. And this is the same thing only 10 verses before the disciples were unable to do with the little boy who had a demon inside of him. They were unable to cast out the demon. And now, only 10 verses later, we have them basically being like a tattletale to Jesus saying, hey, we saw somebody doing this and we told him to stop. And Jesus says, why would you do that? This is, if if, if demons are being cast out in my name, this is the work of God. So the disciples here are Again, used in, in this contrast, this blandness, this you just don't get it. You're not bringing flavor to the world. You are, you are bringing a, a sense of staleness, of blandness. You are not moving forward what I have given you while this other man is. But the disciples are falling into this tribalistic mentality, right? It's us, the 12 of us and Jesus and nobody else. And this is the exact mentality Jesus has come to destroy. The book of Ephesians is all about this, right? Breaking down those walls of hostility. Jesus has come to unite people, not create these little tribes. Not to create these little pockets of believers that don't like each other and have turf wars with one another. Right? We are one body, one baptism, and we serve one Lord. So Jesus says, do not stop him. And he gives three reasons why. He says, first of all, no one who does a miracle in my name will be able to soon afterward speak evil of me. In other words, the one who does miracles in the name of Jesus is moving toward God, not away. And Jesus says, don't stop him from moving toward me, right? The second says, whoever is not against us is for us. This is a powerful statement. And what we see happening, even in our passage this morning, Jesus begins to draw a line in the sand of saying, are you for me or are you against me? And there's no ambiguity, particularly as we move closer to the cross, there's no ambiguity of what it means to be against Jesus. And there's no ambiguity of what it means to be for Jesus. But if we are to be salty disciples, we are for him, right? We are not against him, we are for him. And then third, he says, for whoever gives you a cup of water because you are Christ will never lose his reward. He's saying, listen, you, we, we are called to do uh, kind works. We are called to be generous. We are called to care for all those who claim Christ. Whether or not they are part of our clique, our church, our denomination, our tradition or not. Right? He says, anybody who even gives a cup of water to somebody who claims Christ, will not lose his reward. This is a good thing. We are feeding the body. We are supporting the body. So what Jesus is saying is that though this other man is not following Jesus with the disciples, he is still part of God's people. He is still part of the covenant people. The disciples are, again, falling into this tribalistic mentality, thinking that they are other and we are the ones that have it right. I think we oftentimes fall into this tribalistic mentality ourselves. In fact, this is championed oftentimes, particularly in the Protestant church. I've been to conferences where the main speaker, well known, I respect him a lot, and he's talking and preaching the sermon, and he says, but this part of it, uh, this this is who we are. we are, we plant churches, this is our tribe. And if you don't fall in line with our tribe, there's another tribe for you. So they're even championing this tribalistic language, which when I I look at the Bible, I'm saying, man, this is what Jesus has come to abolish. He wants to get rid of this. We do this with denominational lines, 
right? We say we are Baptist, we are Methodist, we are Presbyterian, we are whatever, and we are the ones that have it right. And of course, we are men and women of convictions, and we read the Bible, and we believe what we believe, and we should stand on that truth. Yet, we must recognize that the body of Christ looks much different than we do outside of our walls and be okay with that. So we fall into this tribalistic mentality as well. And what I'm not talking about is false teachers. I'm not talking about cults. I'm not talking about those who preach a false gospel. The Bible is very clear on that right, and how we are to interact with that, and that should be condemned, but what I am talking about are churches and and brothers and sisters in Christ who might differ on some theological points. They might differ on culture. They might differ on mission. They might differ on polity or church government. They are still brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are to treat them as such, and we are not to tell them to stop proclaiming the gospel because they don't look like us like the disciples did with this man. We see Jesus' heart for unity in John 17, uh, which is his high priestly prayer, right? A couple, a night before he's about to be crucified, he's in the upper room with the disciples, and he prays this prayer. And in the prayer, he says this, John 17, 10 and 11. He says this, All mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. He's, Jesus is praying to the Father here. And I am no longer in the world, but they, my people, are in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me. Then he says this, that they may be one, even as we are one. That they may be one, even as we are one. This is Jesus' desire for his church. And if this is Jesus' desire and Jesus' prayer for the church, you know what that means? This is our future, right? The Father will answer this prayer. He is making his people one. What this means is there will be a day where denominations are gone. There will be a day where the big schism, which we have just celebrated, and rightfully so, the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. But there will be a day where the Catholic and the Orthodox and the Protestant churches, those are all gone. And there is one unified people in God. One bride, one people, one baptism. The people of God being in union with one another. And the beautiful thing about being in union with one another means that we are able to dialogue and we are able to debate and we're able to have our positions without breaking unity, without casting them out and saying, stop acting this way, stop proclaiming the gospel. So this is our testimony. This is what we look forward to, that Jesus is making all his people one, and that will be a reality one day. And as disciples, what should we be working toward? Being at peace with one another. This is how we flavor the world. If you want to see the world not know what to do with the church, it's when the church starts living at peace with one another. If we, if we, even in our city, in our church, if we grow in this, if we can be at peace with one another and demonstrate for Wichita what it looks like for the people of God to truly love each other, the power of that testimony will be great. So, as salty disciples, we are to seek Unity within the household of faith. Yet, unity is something that we must fight for. Unity will never be accomplished as long as we continue to allow the enemy to live. And who is this enemy? It's not unbelievers. It's not different denominations. It's not different political positions. It's not different agendas. The enemy is anything that keeps us from loving one another that keeps us from living for God. The enemy is the power of sin in our lives. And Paul talks about going to war with this enemy in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, where he says this, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. So what are we to do? But by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So salty disciples are not only to flavor the world, they are to go to war in order to preserve the world. So salty disciples preserve the body by waging war. In our call to worship this morning, we read from Exodus chapter 15, which is Moses' song right after 
the Lord brought them through the Red Sea and the Exodus event. And Moses praises Yahweh in verse uh, 3 for being a man of war. It says this, Exodus 15, 3. The Lord, or Yahweh, is a man of war. Yahweh is his name. And Moses even starts this song by praising God for destroying the enemy. It says, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord. Why? For he has triumphed gloriously. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider, he has what he has thrown into the sea. Yahweh has thrown the horse and the rider into the sea. This horse and its rider is referring to the Egyptians who had been enslaving the people of God for 400 years, keeping them in bondage. So God comes in and he rescues his people and he throws the enemy into the sea, right? The horse and his rider went into the sea because uh, if we see the enemies of God throughout the Bible being personified as Egypt, all right, we see this happening over and over again throughout the Bible, that those who uh, would seek to bring slavery on God's people, whether it be sin or temptation or even foreign kingdoms, oftentimes would be referred to as Egypt. And the reason for this is because Egypt had enslaved God's people for so long. So in verse Exodus 15, 4 and 5, we see Moses go on saying, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea. And his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. That last phrase, they went down into the depths like a stone. They sunk, they drowned, they were at the bottom. God went to war on behalf of his people so that they might be saved. So Moses' song goes on to further explain God's triumph over his enemies. And it is important for us to realize God's posture toward sin, God's posture toward his enemies. He wants to see his enemies destroyed. He wants to see his enemies killed. He wants to see his people to be the most militant people on earth, like assassins trained to put to death the deeds of the flesh. And Jesus, being God, Yahweh himself in the flesh, he has the same posture towards sin. Look with me at verse 42, Mark 9, 42. It says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he was, what? He was thrown into the sea. Does this sound familiar? Right? It would be better for him if a great stone was tied around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. See, Mark is thinking of himself or thinking of Jesus as Yahweh himself, the God who brought Israel out of Egypt, who rescued them from slavery and bondage. And now Jesus, doing the second, the great exodus, likewise, is rescuing his people Right? Out of bondage, out of slavery, but it's not to a kingdom, it's to sin. So anyone who would cause one of these little ones who believes in me, one of God's covenant people, to sin, it would be better for him if he were treated like an Egyptian who was thrown into the sea and sunk like a stone. See, Mark has this mentality in mind, and we, likewise, should have this mentality in mind. We should be aware, looking, and, and seeing our world, and seeing those things which would cause us to go astray, to cause us not to love or be in unity with one another or to live for God. And we should seek to put those things to death. And this is sin. These are habits. These are policies, perhaps. But we're not only to look outward. In fact, primarily, we are to look inward, right? Primarily, we are to look at ourselves. And we see Jesus taking this transition, shifting Um, our focus as to the seriousness of sin to look not only outward, but to look inward. So look with me at Mark 9, 43 through 49. It says, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet be thrown into hell. 
And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm dies, or where the worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. So what Jesus is doing here is he is amplifying the seriousness of sin. Right? He's bringing our attention to the seriousness of sin. That it would be better for somebody who causes sin to be thrown into the sea like the Egyptians were. But for you Christians, for you disciples, he's saying, if your hand causes you to sin, it would be better that you cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, it would be better if you cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, it would be better to tear it out than to enter hell with two hands or two feet or two eyes. This is how serious sin is. And as disciples, we should share in this posture towards sin. We should be aware of this, and we should be ready to go to war, like Paul talks about in Romans 8, with our sin. So when we come to a verse like this, we have have to ask the question, is this literal? Well, most of us here, if not all of us, have both of our eyes and hands and feet. So none of us to this point in our lives have taken this verse literally, right? Right? In fact, it was funny, this last week, I have a four-year-old daughter, Piper, and uh, she got some candy. It wasn't Halloween, it was before Halloween, and she had this bowl of candy, and every day she keeps asking for candy, and we limit her candy because she becomes absolutely insane if we give her too much candy. So we say no, but she had this ring pop that she was just really looking forward to. So she asked Mandy if she could have it, and Mandy says no. She asked me, I said, you already asked your mom, you're going to get the same answer from me. And then I was outside, and I was reading, and I look over. Piper was playing, and I see her go like this, and look over, and she throws her hand down like this to try to hide it. I said, Piper, come here. She comes over, and she's all upset. I said, what do you have? She goes, my ring pop. <laughs> I said, what did we tell you about this? I couldn't have it. I'm sorry. And she just goes off. So we took it, and we took it away from her and got rid of it. Now I had an option at this point, right? If I was to follow this. Piper, come inside. You're going to lose your hand. (laughs) You've taken the ring pop. You will never have a ring pop on that hand again. (laughs) So I could have done that, but then it would beg the question, right? It's not just her hand, right? She had an arm that aided her in that process of taking the ring pop out of the basket. So should we cut off her arm as well? But her arm is connected to her shoulder. So then we have to ask, well, do we take the entire shoulder as well? And then her her shoulder is connected to her chest and to her head. And now we're saying, man, does this child have to die for this sin? And yes, right? She, She needs to die for this sin. She's disobeyed. And ultimately, it's not her hand. It's not her arm. It's not her shoulder. It's not her neck. But what it is, is her heart, right? Her heart is what needs to be torn out, and she needs a new one. And this is exactly what God has done for his people, right? He has given us a new heart. He has removed that heart of stone that falls into sin constantly and never can obey and never can please God. And what has he done? He has replaced it with a heart of flesh, and that heart is Christ himself. He has done the surgery for us. We don't need to cut off our hands. Yet, if we have this new heart, we then should have the same view of sin as Jesus has. This new heart says, no, sin is so bad that the old heart had to be ripped away. And the new heart had to be implanted. And for that old heart to be cut out, Jesus had to be put on a cross. This is the seriousness of sin. That even stealing a ring pop when she was not supposed to have it requires justice. It requires a holy God to say, child, you need a new heart. And by the grace that I have for you, I have given that to you in Christ. And now, as disciples with new hearts, how are we to view life? Well, we don't follow the disciples' example in the Gospel of Mark, right? Right? bland, unwilling to to live a life potent for the gospel, unwilling to see the importance of Christian unity. 
But we are to live for the gospel, chasing after Jesus. It is the heart that we need. And Jesus talks about this in Mark chapter 7 uh, when he says, from, For from within, out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All of these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. So we need to be preserved from defilement. We need to preserve one another. Because the warning is real, right? The warning is real. What happens when we don't cut out sin? What are we in danger of? Well, three times he says it, and then he caps it off by even giving a description. You're in danger of hell. Why? Because the followers of God, this is what they do, right? As followers of God with a new heart, we so want to put to death the deeds of the flesh that we will help each other with this surgery. We help each other put to death the sins that are constantly creeping up, whether it be habits, whether it would be um, certain rhythms of life, our thought life, words, motive, actions, desires. We seek to put these to death so that, like Paul says in Romans 8, we might live. That we might live according to the heart that God has given us. For if we let evil continue in our lives, we don't live as true followers of God. If we don't, if we let evil continue and we're okay with it and we justify it, the warning is don't do that because what awaits that mentality is a rejection of God altogether and the danger of hell. So we are to live not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. We are to put to death the deeds of the body. And when we do that, Paul says, you will live. So salty disciples are disciples who know the enemy well. They, we wage war with the enemy. And waging war with the enemy is part of the process of preserving all that God has given us. I love what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 38 and 39. It says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is God speaking. Right? My soul has no pleasure, has no satisfaction for the disciple who does not stand firm in his faith, for the disciple who does not live by faith and shrinks back. There is no flavor for God. There's no pleasure for God. And then in verse 39, he goes on, but we, this is the the author of Hebrews saying about us as a people, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We must continue in the faith. And as we do that, God preserves our soul, like salt preserves uh, food from decay. So salty disciples love the brethren. They seek unity. They hate the enemy. They seek to destroy evil and all of its impulses that might rise up from within to destroy and to decay the life that God has given us. And then finally, we see that salty disciples are purified through fire. Mark 9, 49 says, for everyone will be salted with fire. Here, Jesus is saying that we will be salted or made salty through fire. And this fire is not referring to hellfire of the previous verse, but rather it's referring to the refining fire that God brings. And this refining fire can be anything from circumstances. It can be the word of God. It can be the spirit of God that refines us. The spirit, all throughout the Bible, we see these associations of the spirit and fire. Same with the words of God. He speaks fire. He refines his people. One of my favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 25, 4. And it says, take away the dross from the silver. And the smith has a material for a vessel. Take away the dross. This is the impurities, right? The the defilements of the silver. And the smith, at that point, has material for a vessel to make something. So what a a silversmith would do, he would take the silver and he would put it into this big pot over a fire. And it was the fire would heat up and it would melt the silver down. And as that process was happening, the, 
dross or the impurities of the silver would come to the top and the smith would have to scoop away the impurities. And he would continue this process, stirring it, causing a separation of the purity and the impurities. And he would remove, cut away, get rid of the impurities. And you know how the smith knew the silver was pure and it was ready to be used? He would look into the pot and if he could see his own reflection, at that moment it was, okay, this is, this is good. This is pure. You take away the dross from the silver and you have the material for a vessel. This is what Jesus is doing in our lives, right? We are that silver and he brings us through the fire so that we might be salted, that we might have flavor, that we might uh, preserve one another, preserve our souls, preserve our bodies. (coughs) And he is purifying us. And as he does that, what are we doing? We are being created into his image. He is looking at us, and as the impurities are going away, he is seeing his own reflection in us more and more clearly. This is the Christian life. This is what it is to be a a disciple who follows Christ. We face many struggles in our lives. We get discouraged. We think, God, what are you doing? Yet, we forget that this is part of the process, right? Right? The fire hurts. The separation is painful. Yet, when we allow that to happen, he is preserving us. And we become a vessel that will display his glory. We'll become a people that is so focused on the things that God is focused on. We love the things that he loves and we hate the things that he hates. We put to uh, death the deeds of the flesh. We live as disciples bringing unity and peace to one another. We bring glory to God in all that we do. We are purified by fire. So may our church be full of salty disciples, right? May you not be a bland testimony for Christ in your life. May you be one who is willing to step into the fire, be salted, as Jesus says, be purified. Be willing to bring the flavor of the gospel to a lost and dying world. May you preserve one another, know each other well enough to be able to help each other put to death the deeds of the flesh because we all have blind spots and we just can't see them. This is why we need one another. And may we be willing to walk through this process of being purified for the glory of God. Let's pray.